God, I hurt all over. Oh, well, at least that's finished now. Jeez. <sighs> okay. Back to business. So, where have you been for the last week? Hmm? Oh. Wow, you're, you're still there. Um... Yeah, you know, just doing boring stuff. You know, that was up there, fixing the roof. Uh-huh. Fixing the roof, were you? Yeah. There was a leak in the roof. That's why I needed that hammer, to... You know. And the face mask? Did you need that to... Fix the roof? No, that was to protect against bugs. You know how much I hate bug bites. Right. And the voice modulator? Was that also to protect against bug bites? Oh, that. Um, no. No, that was just for fun. Just for fun, huh? Interesting. That's very, very interesting, because it seems to me that maybe you weren't fixing the roof at all. Maybe the real reason why you're so sore and beat up right now is because you were really competing in a wrestling match and then getting your ass kicked in humiliating fashion by a 60-year-old cripple. <laughs> well, that's just silly. <sighs> yeah. We'll see. Yes, we will. All right. Bound for glory. One thing I liked a lot about BFG was they actually made an effort to make the set look different from the impact zone. You know, different colored ring ropes, and I don't like the wheelchair ramp. I never liked the wheelchair ramp, but it is different. And for a pay-per-view, different is good. X Division title match, Zima Ion versus Bob Van Dam. I'm pretty sure Van Dam is over the 225-pound weight limit, but I guess we're just forgetting about that because... Well, fuck story continuity. I thought this was a pretty good opener. Nothing incredible by X Division standards, but it was solid. Now, there was no story here, though, so there's really not that much to say. Van Dam winning wasn't that surprising, but it still bothered me. You know, Ion had so much more to gain by winning this match. Van Dam gets nothing out of it. Plus, the only storyline the X Division had that really meant anything was Ion Sorensen, which means a lot less now that Ion just lost the belt. But... And I said this before, they really didn't have enough X Division talent to keep Ion's title reign interesting until Sorensen came back. You know, maybe he can win it back before then. But they were in a tough spot with this one, so I guess I understand him dropping the title, but you couldn't fucking put it on Kenny King instead. Van Dam's not going to do anything interesting with it, I think we all know that. You know, maybe it'll lead to Joey Ryan getting a title shot, that'd be cool. Otherwise, fuck no job, Rob. And bring back Kenny King, damn it. Yeah! TV title match, Magnus and Samoa Joe. These two have a lot of chemistry together. I expected this to be really good, and it was. This is probably Magnus' best singles match that I've seen. It's just a shame that it has so little hype. And I am a firm Magnus supporter. I always have been. But I think Joe going over here was the right call. Magnus winning the title after all the losses he's had recently really would have made no sense. He needs to be rebuilt. You know, for now, I think it was enough that he had a competitive match with Joe and he looked strong in defeat. And I think this feud will continue, too. You know, I do think Magnus will be the next TV champion, and he really should be, but he didn't have to win the belt on this night. Street Fight, James Storm versus Bobby Roode, the match that was a year in the making. Why the hell was this third on the card? I'm just asking. Oh, what a bunch of bull****. And why was King Mo out there? You have him as the special enforcer for a street fight where there are no rules to enforce. So, he's there just so he could get Rude to back off the referee one time? It seemed weird to have him be there if he's not going to do anything, but it did keep the focus on Rude and Storm, so maybe I shouldn't complain. This was great. You had two guys who know how to tell a story with a great story for them to tell. It was a very personal rivalry, at least it was six months ago. Therefore, to sell it, they had to do some really sick stuff to each other, and that's what they did. You know, spear on the announce table. You know, Storm was bleeding all over the place. Rude took two thumbtack bumps. This was exactly what it should have been. And even though the intensity did cool off a lot over the summer, this was a very fitting conclusion to this feud. Outstanding stuff here. Al Snow versus Joey Ryan. Al Snow is actually in better shape than I expected. 
though I did appreciate him foregoing traditional wrestling gear. It's not the 90s anymore, and nobody wants to see you in spandex. Look, we knew what we were getting with this one. It wasn't supposed to be a four-star classic. It was just about paying off this storyline and Joey Ryan getting his contract. But if that was the end game, why did the booking call for Al Snow to kick his ass to that extent? Yeah, why was Joey Ryan booked so weakly here? I understand wanting to give the fans some catharsis after all the stuff he did, but this was just overkill. So eventually Matt Morgan jumps out of the crowd, nails Al Snow, and Joey Ryan wins. Are they aligned with each other? I don't know. I think it would make sense, with the viral nature of the Joey Ryan angle and them doing a similar thing now with Morgan invading the house shows. You know, there have been much worse pairings in this company. I wouldn't mind that. Tag titles, AJ and Angle, Tex-Mex, and the World Tag Team Champions of the World. This was another great match. Not surprising since you had five great guys in there. Also Hernandez, who totally botched that Hurricane Rana spot on the ring apron. But other than that, even he had a good night. There were some terrific sequences with Angle, Kaz, and Daniels, and the multiple dives to the outside were awesome. Big thumbs up on the match. Did not agree with the winners. Daniels and Kaz have been so entertaining lately, I didn't see any reason for them to lose the belts, especially not to Chavo and Hernandez, who were kind of awkwardly shoehorned into this feud in the first place. And I don't think I was alone in thinking that. Tex-Mex win, the crowd boos. Chavo has to name drop Eddie to get them some cheap face heat. I really wish he'd stop doing that. Still a great match, I just wasn't crazy about the outcome. Knockouts title, Terra vs. Tessmacher. We saw the British Boot Camp contestants during the entrances, that was cool. Blossom Twins looking cute as hell. Mm. I was not surprised that Terra won. I was very surprised that she won clean, did not see that coming. And this is something I really didn't agree with. I thought Tessmacher needed to keep the belt a while longer. Now, if they hadn't flip-flopped the title with Madison Rain, I'd be okay with this. But the fact is, Tessmacher had two kinda short title reigns instead of one good title reign, and she never really got that big signature victory to validate either one of them. And honestly, she deserved that. If you compare her now to the wrestler she was 18 months ago, it's night and day. I can't believe how much she's improved. And I'd say this was easily one of Tessmacher's best matches, if not her best match. Now, Taryn Terrell did look a little confused at times, but Tessmacher had a great showing. You know, she broke out a few new moves with the diving Hurricane Rana and the twirly DDT thing. I mean, you have to be impressed with how much progress she's made in a short time. She may have lost, but she's got nothing to be embarrassed about. The post-match stuff was something Tara might be embarrassed about, though. She introduces her mystery boyfriend from Hollywood, and Jesse Goddard comes out to absolutely no reaction whatsoever. People are chanting, who are you? No one knows who this fucker is, and they don't seem to care either. Him and Tara start making out, and the crowd pretty much dropped a deuce on this. TNA signed Goddard because he was on Big Brother, which they seem to think is a really big deal. I don't know why. I thought Big Brother was canceled years ago. Now, he is a wrestler, but I've been watching him in OVW, and he's easily the worst out of all the developmental talent they've got. He is not ready for TV. If he's just going to be Tara's arm candy and cutting promos and stuff, that'd be okay. But I'm in no hurry to see them put him in the ring, and you shouldn't be either. Sting and Bully Ray versus the Aces and Eights. I don't think it was ever actually announced officially, but Hogan made this a no-DQ match on the pre-show, which is really, really stupid for a couple reasons. Number one, you already had a street fight on this card, which is basically the same thing. Number two, we know the Aces and Eights fight dirty, and they play the numbers game whenever they can, but then you make a stipulation that lets them interfere in the match as much as they want, and it's completely legal. Not shockingly, this is what led to them winning the match. Nice one, Hogan. Brilliantly done. You people are fools! The low point of the pay-per-view by a freaking mile. This was lousy. The only cool thing was Joseph Park going batshit on the Aces and Ace. That was awesome. But the match was a complete mess. Just a big, ugly clusterfuck. The crowd was not into it at all. And I told you this would happen. A guy in a mask as an opponent just isn't compelling. It didn't get over at No Surrender. It didn't get over here. Anyway... The Aces and Eights cheat their way to victory, and thanks to Hogan, it's all totally legal. So now they have free access to the Impact Zone, which, as I explained, they basically already had. So what did this match accomplish? Not a goddamn thing. Then Hogan hobbles out to the ring, beats up every single guy by himself, and unmasks one of them, and it's Devon. What the fuck? Shocking? Yeah. It wasn't Jared or Bischoff, so that's good. 
But after four months of buildup, you expect some kind of major reveal here, and... And... And instead it's Devon? The crowd had no idea how to react, chanting, this is awkward, and I was right there with them. Now apparently Devon is not the leader, he's just a member, so there's gonna be more to the story, I suspect. But for right now, much like the fans in Phoenix, I don't know what the hell to make of this. World Heavyweight Championship match, Austin Aries versus Jeff Hardy. This was a great match. We knew these guys would deliver a great match, and I hope Hardy thanked Austin Aries profusely for selling so well and making him look amazing. Hardy winning has me conflicted. It was obviously a business decision. He's their biggest moneymaker, like it or not. His contract is up in a few months, so this was basically TNA just dropping to their knees, unzipping Jeff's fly with their teeth, and... Well, you know. Creatively, I don't agree with this at all. Aries needed this win much more than Hardy did. He's the more complete performer. You can do a lot more with Aries as the champion than you can with Hardy. You could feud him with James Storm, which I thought was the next logical step for him. I don't know who the hell you feud Hardy with now. Hopefully not Devon. But you basically just proved here that everything Aries said about him getting overlooked and Hardy getting preferential treatment was true. I don't like that at all. So it might be good for business, but from a creative standpoint, I really can't support this. It was a great match, though, and it ended the pay-per-view on a high note. And I think this was a very strong bout for glory overall. There were some big issues, obviously, but six out of eight matches were solid or better. So wrestling-wise, I was very satisfied. It wasn't a perfect pay-per-view, but it was damn good. You know, for a post Bound for Glory show, which you'd think would be the starting point for a lot of new storylines and fresh feuds and stuff, it really feels like not a whole lot was accomplished this week. Devon comes out to address that whole situation, and he's about to explain why exactly he did what he did, joining the Aces and Eights, and I was interested to see how they were going to rationalize this, but then it didn't happen. Sting comes out to interrupt him before he can say anything, so we don't get any answers this week after all. Thanks a fucking lot, Sting. Why do you even care? You already know why Devon joined the Aces and Ace. You're the one who recruited him. So Sting brings the entire roster out with him, and they have another big brawl, which we really don't get to see because they go to commercials at that point, and when the show comes back, the brawl is over. Then they make Sting versus Devon for the main event, and right there, any interest I had is gone. The crowd is chanting, we want bully, we want bully, which the writers had to expect, but no. They're doing Sting, because that's what wrestling fans want to see in 2012, right? This whole show is ridiculous! If they're saving Bully and Devon for a bigger show, fine. But did they have to go with Sting here? Look, I know TNA love this guy to death, but what does pushing Sting really do for you at this point? Does it build your future? No. Does it get a ratings hike? Maybe a small one, but it's nothing that's going to carry over a week from now. Can we just give Sting a rest already? All due respect to him, he's a legend, no question about it, but sooner or later, TNA are going to have to stop sucking up to this guy and start moving forward without him. Next, Robbie E. gets another TV title shot. <coughs> Alright, seriously, TNA, how many fucking TV title shots is this loser going to get? It's getting kind of ridiculous now. But, but, it's okay. I'm not even mad about it this time, because the booking here was absolutely perfect. Samoa Joe is just a freaking buzzsaw cutting right through these two schmucks. He completely no-sells everything Robbie does, destroys Rob Terry on the outside for daring to interfere in his match, then hops back into the ring and chokes out Robbie E. like a bitch. Yes! Then Terry tries to attack him after the match, and he does the same thing to Terry, just because he can. Samoa Joe looks like a juggernaut, and the Robbies look like the biggest jobbers on Earth. Thank you. You're welcome. And you're probably tired of hearing me say this by now, but this was the perfect time for Magnus to show up and attack Joe. But he was nowhere to be seen. Again. For God's sake, TNA. Joe and Magnus. Is this feud still going on? Is it finished now? Are they still feuding or not? 
It's a real testament to how inconsistently it's been booked that I honestly have no idea. So, a, a great squash match for Joe, sure. But if Magnus wasn't going to show up here, then it seemed kind of pointless. Knockouts time. Terra versus ODB. Oh, Christ. Out of all the knockout feuds you could do, did you really have to revisit this one? Their original feud was so awful, why on earth would you ever want to do it again? Oh my god, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's coming in here! He's gonna puke! He's gonna puke! He's gonna puke! Yeah, he's gonna puke! Holy crap, this was bad. ODB is not a great wrestler at the best of times, but when you have her talking on the phone with Eric Young during the match and have Tara constantly being distracted by sucking face with Jesse Goddard's, this had less than zero chance of being any good. Goddard's was actually kind of funny with his reactions to ODB and his facial expressions and stuff, I'll give him that. But that aspect has never been his problem. His main weakness as a performer was and is the wrestling. If he's just going to be a supporting player in whatever Tara's doing, that's okay, I guess. But God help me if they're going to feud with ODB and Eric Young now. I can't imagine a feud I would give less of a shit about. Historically, ODB and Tara has not been a good matchup. But if you add Eric Young and all the annoying crap he does, as well as Jesse Goddard, who still needs a lot of work as a wrestler, there is no way this is going to go anywhere I'm going to like. They had a tag title match with Chavo and Hernandez versus Gunner and Cash. Match was okay. Chavo and Hernandez win, and that's really it. Your Tex Mex weren't teasing a heel turn anymore. I'm not so sure jobbing out Gunner and Cash was a good idea if they're so short on tag teams still. And I don't know who Tex Mex feud with now, unless they're going back to Kaz and Daniels again, which wouldn't be bad, but it wouldn't be new either. Now that's a to be continued. Jeff Hardy comes up for his victory celebration in the hour main event spot. So chin up, Aries. Hardy's also playing second fiddle to the Aces and Eights. Austin Aries comes out pretty quickly to mock Hardy's victory with balloons and cookies. That was hilarious. Then he does what I and probably every other smart mark has always wanted to do. He takes Hardy's ugly-ass custom belt and he spits on it. Austin Aries is a god. Yeah! He completely made this segment something great. Hardy actually did almost nothing here. It was all Aries, and it was fantastic. I didn't even mind that they brought back Jeff's gaudy as hell custom belt because it feeds right into the angle of Ares being pissed off about the preferential treatment Hardy gets. It's just more fuel for the fire. And I like how Ares does have a rematch clause, but he's going to be strategic and cash it in when Hardy's vulnerable. At a big pay-per-view like Genesis, I'm assuming. That's smart. You know, that's something an intelligent heel character would do. Picking his spot carefully and not just cashing it in right away because he lost his cool. So, Austin Ares is awesome. I still think having him lose the title was the wrong decision, but since it did happen, I think they're handling the fallout the right way. Angle, Styles, and Daniels have a triple threat match where the winner gets one of the spots in the Championship Thursday selection process to get a shot at Jeff Hardy. How did any of these guys get into this match? Didn't they all lose at Bound for Glory? I'm just saying. The match was good, but probably not as good as you'd expect. Maybe they were worn out from their match on Sunday. It wouldn't surprise me. Angle wins, which I wasn't happy about. I was rooting for Daniels. He tries to shake AJ's hand, and AJ blows him off. TNA. Before anything happens with that, I have to say something. Kurt Angle is a close second behind Christopher Daniels when it comes to being AJ's go-to guy for storylines and feuds. We've seen this many times. It's very, very old. Can we please not do it again? Here's a crazy thought. Put AJ, and Kurt for that matter, in a storyline with someone he has not feuded with yet. That's what I want. A new, fresh opponent for AJ to play off of. How about Joey Ryan? How about Kenny King? Hell, I'd even take Matt Morgan. Ooh, ooh, speaking of Matt Morgan, get this. Apparently, Morgan is now doing a storyline about how TNA management thinks he has no charisma. Oh, God. So many jokes. Brain overflowing. Skull can't contain them. Uh, 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 uh! <laughs> Hogan dropped a bunch of insider terms on Morgan that probably hit pretty close to home about why he hasn't accomplished more in TNA. Inconsistent on the mic, etc. Made some pretty good points, actually. I'm kind of surprised they're going there with Morgan, but I guess I can't say this doesn't ring true. So, screw it, I'm intrigued. Joseph Park wants one of the Aces and Eights. He's begging Hogan to let him fight one of the Aces and Eights. Joseph, this is just me thinking outside the box here, but 
Instead of fighting one of them, why don't you... press charges against them for kidnapping you, holding you hostage for weeks, and assaulting you with a hammer? You know, like a lawyer would do? I know I've said this before, but why the hell did they make Joseph Park a lawyer in the first place if he's never going to actually do what a lawyer would do in any situation? It's a simple question. And while I'm on the subject, didn't Joseph Park discover the identity of the person behind the Aces and Eights? Isn't that why they kidnapped him in the first place? What, we're just forgetting about that now? Or was the hammer to the skull supposed to take care of that? <laughs> Unbelievable. Now Park doesn't even remember? You got off easy. James Storm cuts a promo. And now we're talking. A cowboy with a microphone is always a good thing. He checks some things off his personal bucket list, kick Bobby Roode's ass, drink a lot of beer. Now there's only one thing left, and that's win back the world heavyweight title. And if that's what's up next for James Storm, hell yeah. It would make a lot more sense if Austin Aries was still the champion right now, but what's done is done. Bobby Roode comes out to rain on his parade. I carried you for years, all your success is because of me, blah blah blah. And then Storm kicks his head off. A great segment with terrific promos. Personally, I really hope the Roode-Storm feud is done now, though. I don't care to see it continue. I think it's time for both of them to move on to something new, but if this was just to put the period at the end of their rivalry and give the fans closure, then fine. Then came our main event. The first Impact main event after Bound for Glory 2012, Sting vs. Devon. And they have the match that you would expect Sting and Devon to have in 2012. I'm not going to call it a snooze fest, but it was nothing you were talking about on Friday morning and probably not even Thursday night. It was competent, but there was nothing exciting going on here. Mostly it was pretty dull. Even the announcers sounded bored. Although, to be fair, Tanae always sounds like that. Sting is about to beat Devon, and so in a turn of events you probably could have called in your sleep, the Aces and Eights show up to save him and cause a DQ. So Devon's run as a mega heel is off to a really bad start. Then there's another huge brawl in which nothing really happens. Bully Ray finally shows up with a baseball bat to run off the Aces and Eights, which they almost missed because the show ran out of time, and this entire segment fell completely flat. The Devon situation just feels really, really awkward. Him being a mouthpiece for this group is alright, but Devon as a main eventer going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sting? I just don't buy it. And as a post-Bound for Glory show, I have to call this one a failure. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't good either. You know, it seems like they're continuing a lot of feuds or just going back to old ones instead of starting new ones. Nothing eventful happened. No new developments or new information, just more stalling. You know, Devon did hint that there was one guy behind the Aces and Eights. You that recruited him for reasons we still haven't learned, but beyond that, it's just a lot of treading water. And that's why this angle doesn't work anymore. There's so little forward progression in the story, it just feels like it's moving in slow motion. We're just now getting to the point that we should have reached like a month and a half ago with the unmasking of the first member. It's like they're stuck in neutral while they wait for something to happen. What? I don't know, but something big needs to happen, and it needs to happen soon, or there's going to be no salvaging this thing. Oh, God damn it. God damn it! Will you just stop with this farce already? You are the leader of the Aces and Eights! Just admit it! Never! I admit nothing. Oh, oh yeah, you go right ahead. You threaten me with your shotgun all you want. That might have worked last week when you made me call the finish of the main event wrong just to make me look stupid. Just like Sting and Bully Ray beating Kaz and Daniels, where, once again, you've got the heel losing a match that has nothing to do with the feud he's this in. This is awesome. If Rude was going to lose this That's match, not how the main event ended at all. James Storm he's going to look like Rude such an ass. Chair, Storm takes the chair away. Rude turns around and walks into the twist of fate. But it won't work this time. I'll never admit that I'm the leader of the Aces and Eights. I'll die first. And if you feel like testing my fortitude, well... Well, then you'd better be able to hit a moving target! 